taking one after class. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. We're going to go ahead and get started, and uh, maybe a few more people will trickle in. Otherwise, you will have uh, a lot of food afterwards if you want it. Uh, wine and cheese, shrimp cocktail, cheesecake from the Cheesecake Factory. Uh, thank you to the dean's office for going all out to help us with uh, having rescheduled this. Uh, today we have a speaker from the University of Penn Lo Pennsylvania Law School, uh, Amy Wax. She has a very diverse and interesting background. She got her JD at Columbia in 1987, but that was after getting her medical degree at Harvard Medical School in 1981 and acting as a resident in neurology at New York Hospital at Cornell Medical Center and then as a consulting neurologist at the Bronx Cross County Clinic in the Bronx, New York and at Brooklyn North Medical Group from 1985 to 1987. After law school, she was a law clerk to the Honorable Abner Mikva for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. She was then in the office of the Solicitor General of the United States Department of Justice for seven years from 1988 to 1994 as an assistant to the Solicitor General. She then was a professor at University of uh, Virginia Law School, and uh, she has for the last few years been at the University of Pennsylvania as a professor. Please uh, welcome Amy Wax, and then she will her com her speech, uh, which will be about 20 minutes or so, will be followed by comments from a man who needs no introduction at the school, uh, Professor Chemerinsky, and uh, then it will be open to questions and answers from you. Thank you, Professor Wax. Thank you for inviting me, and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I am not going to overstay my welcome at the podium, I hope. I'm just going to speak briefly about the topic, and I can't wait to hear Professor Chemerinsky's response. Uh, my topic today is blaming the victim. Indeed, the title of my talk is How to Think About Blaming the Victim. And I should explain briefly how I came to this topic. Uh, as I was asked on an LA radio program last week on the Black Network, uh, how is it that a white Jewish Ivy League law professor comes to deal with this very, very sensitive topic? Well, the answer is that I teach about it. I teach remedies, but I also teach social welfare law and policy. And it's impossible to engage the subject of poverty and redistribution without talking about group disadvantage. And group disadvantage in this country is unfortunately uh, largely about race. Uh, Bill Cosby's repeated suggestion that the behavior of some American blacks impedes group progress has transgressed the longstanding taboo against blaming the victim. And of course, blaming the victim, group disadvantage, these are not subjects that are just about African Americans. They are about many different kinds of groups. But as is so often the focus in our country, uh, African Americans are front and center in the discussions. Defined by sociologist William Ryan in 1971 as an attempt to explain inequality by finding defects in the victims of inequality, this victim blaming exercise is virtually banned from polite discourse and my submission is that it's time for that to change. Uh, the disdain for blaming the victim, in my view, is based on a fundamental conceptual confusion, a conceptual confusion that leads to a kind of psychological and emotional rut into which I think people who attempt to address this issue uh, often fall. No one can deny that black Americans have endured a history of sustained mistreatment, and I'm not here to deny that and that these wrongs have wreaked immeasurable harm. But to me, the interesting question, and the one on which my students and colleagues are deeply confused, is not how the harms occur, but how to reverse them. And I think that those two questions have to be kept quite separate. The law of remedies can help us here. A central tenet of the law of remedies is that someone who harms another person, the wrongdoer, must undo that harm. So justice requires that the culprit right the wrong by restoring the victim to what we call in the remedies biz the rightful position, right? the state he would have enjoyed if the harm had never been done, if the wrong had never been done. And in distinguishing liability from remedy, right, the causing of the harm from the undoing of the harm, the law recognizes this ideal, but it also 
acknowledges that the reality can and often does fall short of the ideal. So the wrongdoer may quite literally lack the power to restore the victim to make the victim whole. That's a commonplace. As I've written, the assailant cannot restore the eye that he has put out. The murderer cannot bring the dead child back to life. So in that sense, justice may be out of reach. Now, I would submit that racial disadvantage in this country today is a special case of that problem. But it's really a case in which the, victor, the victim's injuries can be healed, but not by the perpetrator, not by the wrongdoer, not by white society, which has brought us uh, through its crimes to this current juncture. Rather, in a cruel twist of fate, the victim is the only one that can wholly undo the harms he's suffered at the other wrong, other's wrongs. The victim has to restore himself. And in order to illustrate this point, I want to give you what I term the parable of the paraplegic. Suppose a reckless driver runs over a pedestrian, leaving him unable to walk. The driver pays for the pedestrian's rehabilitation, his physical therapy, but he is told, the pedestrian is told, that his recovery will require a long, exhausting, and painful effort. Without his painful effort, his sustained effort, he will never walk again. Now, not surprisingly, the victim is very angry. He feels unjustly treated. How is this fair? Why does he face this overwhelming uphill struggle? Doesn't matter. There's no way around it. Although the driver must pay, he can't guarantee success. The victim, he cannot make the victim walk again. Now, in my view, this parable illuminates the present dilemma of black disadvantage. Once again, today's social problems are the outgrowth of slavery and gross oppression. But unfortunately, that gross oppression has issued in what economists and sociologists would call injuries to human capital. Right? The habits, the frame of mind, the behaviors, the group's norms and mores have been transformed in a way which make it impossible for members of the group to grasp the opportunities that are before them as grosser and more external forms of bias fall away as they have fallen away in our country through centuries of progress in civil rights. So the victim himself has changed in ways that place him beyond the reach of outside help alone. Now the most enduring legacy of racism are, is, these injuries to human capital. Right? So now we have evidence that suggests that behavioral factors like low educational attainment, poor socialization, family disarray, non-marital childbearing, paternal abandonment are more important to the fate, certainly of the African American community, than overt outside discrimination or outsiders discrimination. And we can go into that evidence if you like. But what are we to make of that? Society's power to address these behaviors is necessarily modest, right? Short, short of outright coercion, it is impossible for the government or outsiders to change dysfunctional behavior or make good choices for individuals. So no one can force a person to obey the law, study hard, be well-mannered, stay married, be a devoted father and husband, live by the bourgeois values, which are the values that allow people in our society to get ahead and indeed are essential to getting ahead in our society, indispensable. Nonetheless, we refuse to recognize that because the quest for justice blinds us to it, right? We demand that those who created the problem solve it the ideal is that society should fix what's broken, so everybody wants to believe that society has the power to do so. If discrimination caused the problem, then getting rid of discrimination is the solution. If racism is to blame, purging racism will do the trick. I call that the myth of reverse causation, and I think that there is this uh, unavoidable habit to 
adopt to embrace the myths of reverse causation. It's almost like a tick that we can't get beyond. However, the law recognizes that reverse causation doesn't always work. Liability can diverge from remedy, and the one who caused the problem can't necessarily solve it. So how, does, how should this color our thinking about racial inequality? Well, four quick points. First, accepting that the victim must heal himself is not really blaming the victim, because we're not exonerating centuries of oppression for the problem. Once again, the run-up to the current dilemma is someone else's fault. But that doesn't mean that that someone else can, in fact, reverse the harm, restore the victim to the rightful position, right? The government has to do what it can to provide equal opportunity, but there is no guarantee of success. Second, true racial justice may just not be achievable, right? Is it fair to put the weight of self-restoration on the victim? It isn't. It is not fair, okay? If you take the fundamental remedial paradigm as the gold standard, and I think that we should do that. But just as the careless driver can bankroll the pedestrian's recovery but can't guarantee success, we can provide basic opportunities for others to grasp, for the victim to grasp, but we can't force them or even cause them to take advantage of them, and there is no magic bullet program that we know about that can do so. Third, rehearsing the history of racial oppression, although it's important for moral clarity, is actually of very little use, in my mind, in addressing current inequalities. And I speak from experience here. I teach social welfare, and I have been impressed more and more in my experience as a scholar and teacher in this area that the way out of the dilemma may in no wise resemble the path in. They're really, I'm not saying that every remedial example in the whole universe is like this, but I do believe that in the case of racial disadvantage, we really learn very little by rehearsing the history of oppression and of slavery. It tells us nothing about what to do about current fatherlessness, current low educational achievement, current high rates of joblessness, uh, criminal behavior, and the like. Finally, the persistence of racial disadvantage doesn't mean that society is not doing enough. We cannot take the failure to close gaps between minorities and the majority population as dispositive evidence that the government needs to do more. Because right now, I think what we need is not more programs but a kind of conversion experience, almost a sea change in the outlook within the minority community of what needs to be done and how to move forward. And I'm not going to minimize the difficulty of doing that. I think one of the problems in the victim seeing himself as a free agent who paradoxically has no choice but to take the burden upon himself is that it's not just a matter of individual choice. There are group norms and group mores that are operating right, to hold people back. It's really, in some respects, the mystery of culture. But make no mistake, we should not collapse the distinction between hard and fast external obstacles and internal demons right, that we need to overcome. And although others have raised those demons, I think it is important for the victim to see himself as capable of, indeed, as having no choice but to overcome those demons. And I want to read you just uh, from a letter in closing that I received, uh, one of many, many letters I received when I published a series of articles in the Wall Street Journal and then appeared on the O'Reilly Factor uh, a while ago, which had people coming out of the woodwork. You just would not believe how many people watch Fox News, hard as that is to believe. Um, someone from California, I think, I'm not entirely sure, but I think he is an African American. Um, and he wrote to me, you pointed out that the victim has to heal himself in the case of black Americans. Ultimately, I believe this to be true. But how does a person engaged in dysfunctional behavior, as you pointed out, fix himself? 
especially when so many around him may be in the same condition. And is the payoff for doing this really worth it? Blacks who achieve in mainstream America pay a very high price for their success. Their achievements and successes often isolate them from other blacks, including family, but don't really make them that acceptable to whites. You've heard this before, I'm sure, but it is true. I will even hazard to say that many black males may not want to succeed if it means thinking, talking, and functioning like the educated European American man at the expense of the black man's culture and lifestyle. As troubled as it often may be, wouldn't it still be better than being like the oppressor? If, uh, of course it isn't, but many think that it is, and this has been so incredibly damaging to the black community. The loneliness and isolation of black success may be one of the biggest hurdles to get over. In the end, blacks still must do more to help themselves no matter what the price. I agree with you, it is their only hope. I think on this point you are correct. But in terms of how to achieve that, how to overcome those hurdles, once again, I think what outsiders can do is necessarily limited. It's for us to guess, but for the people within the community somehow to figure out. Thank you. I want to thank the Federalist Society for organizing this and Professor Wax for coming. And both the Federalist Society and Professor Wax we need to reschedule to accommodate the event with the Israeli ambassador today. As I read Professor Wax's writings about this and I listened to her today, my initial instinct is to say, well, sure, we're all in favor of personal responsibility. And to the extent that what she's arguing for is greater personal responsibility, isn't that a good thing? But as reflected more, I find what she's saying very disturbing. What she really wants to do is to change the way in which we talk about race in society, and therefore the way we think about race in society. And I think her orientation would be quite destructive. I think that she's only partially accounting for the cause of the inequalities in society. And even worse, I think she's trying to excuse society from its responsibilities to do more in lessening what the government should be doing. And in this way, I very much disagree with her. And so what I'm really here to say is it's bad to blame the victim. Because when we blame the victim, we're really excusing ourselves from our greater social responsibility. And so I just want to make two points in response to Professor Wax. First, I want to argue that it's unfair to blame the victim. That continuing discrimination, the legacy of continuing discrimination, is a key part of social inequalities. I think what's missing entirely from Professor Wax's discussion is the extent to which there are enormous inequalities today that are not at all the fault of the victim. Start with education. There's tremendous disparities in how much is spent on a white child's education compared to a black or Latino child's education in this country. I've seen estimates such as from the Harvard sociologist Christopher Jenks, there's as much as a 20% gap on average on what's spent on an average white child's education compared to the average black child's education. That's not because black parents care less about education than white parents. It's because of the correlation between race and poverty in our society. Another example where there's continuing discrimination is with regard to the criminal justice system. Studies have shown that at every point of the criminal justice system, a white and a black who are otherwise similarly situated are treated differently. A white is more likely to not be stopped by the police for the same offense that a black is likely to stop. If a white and a black are stopped by the police, the black is much more likely to be arrested by the police than the white is. When charging goes on, the black is much more likely to be charged with a more serious offense, even if there's the same prior criminal record as the white. When it comes to sentencing for the same crimes, blacks receive much larger sentences than whites. This isn't because blacks want to be sentenced to greater amounts, or they want to be stopped more by the police. It's because of the continuing racism in society. Take the area of housing. Studies have been done, and I'll read one, that talks about the tremendous discrimination against blacks in the housing market. Um, one study found, for example, and I'll just read it briefly, between 1993 and 1998, subprime lending, loans with higher interest rates and predatory foreclosure practices grew by 30 times in Chicago's black neighborhoods 
but only two and a half times in white residential areas. Race, not social class, explains this difference. In 1998, subprime lenders made 53% of the home loan equity loans in middle class black areas, but only 12% of the loans in middle income white areas. Healthcare studies have shown that race alone often determines the health care that's available, comparing what's available to blacks and whites. We could start with the fact, of course, that the infant mortality right among blacks is twice what it is among whites, and then go to certain disease studies. And again, I can just read some statistics that are reflective of many studies that have been done. Um, even when blacks have equal access to medical care, recent evidence indicates significant racial disparities in treatment and care remain. For example, in my Medicare beneficiaries of symbol age, gender, and income, blacks are 25% less likely to have mammography screening for breast cancer, 57% less likely to have reduction in hip fracture, and it goes on with other types of things. I think what's absent from Professor Wack's description is any acknowledgement of the continuing racism that exists and its effects in society. And so I want to read some of Professor Wax's words back, and these are words that were in the Wall Street Journal and that she echoed today. She says, evidence suggests that soft behavioral factors, including low educational attainment, poor socialization and work habits, paternal abandonment, family disarray, and non-marital childbearing, now loom larger than overt exclusion as barriers to racial equality. I don't think we could ever measure what's more or less responsible. I'm certainly willing to say that personal responsibility is important, but a full account has to also look to the extent to which discrimination continues. And that's completely absent from what she says. She says in Wright's Third, rehearsing the history of racial oppression, although important for moral clarity, is of little use in addressing current inequalities. I couldn't disagree more with that, because I think you can only understand the current inequalities is seeing them as a legacy that goes back to the earliest days in American history. I would be tempted, but I won't, to ask of the students in this room, how many had parents who went to college? My guess is a very substantial percentage of the students at Duke Law School have parents who went to college. My guess is that's true of any of the prestigious law schools. That's a tremendous advantage that those who have parents with higher education have that affects them throughout their lives. Now, children who come from families where the parents haven't gone to college automatically start with a disadvantage. Social class is often not immutable, very difficult to change. And I see no recognition of that at all in Professor Wax's analysis. But the second point I want to make is an even more important one, and that I think that Professor Wax excuses society of its responsibility for these problems. I think what her real point is that we should focus more on individual responsibility, and then it becomes a convenient excuse for excusing society of its duties to deal with the legacy of race and the responsibility for poverty. And she says this explicitly. Again, I'll read her words, and she said them here today. She says, this means that what the government must do what it can to eliminate racial disadvantage, given the nature of the problem where the role is necessarily modest. She says, the greatest need at present may not be more government spending in new programs, but a conversion experience. Here, too, I very much disagree. I think there's a need for much more aggressive efforts by government to equalize educational opportunities. So a black child has the same expenditures on average as a white child. There's a need much more to equalize spending on medical care. The reality is that about one out of four children lives below the poverty line, and these are children who don't have access to medical care. There's 35 million people in this country, many of them are children, have no access to medical care at all. There's a need for housing to be available in a much more aggressive way. Our country, at least over the last 30 years, has practiced a not so benign neglect when it comes to the issues of race and poverty. And rather than say it's the individual's responsibility, let blacks pull themselves up by their bootstraps, what I would say is we need much more consistent, much more effective social problems to deal with this. And so I think it's at that level we could have an interesting discussion. You know, Professor Wax and I can talk about what should we do to equalize educational opportunities. We could talk about what should we do to equalize medical care. We could talk about what should we do to lessen racism in the criminal justice system. We should talk about how can we equalize opportunities to get in colleges and universities. That's where the discussion should be. But what worries me about her rhetoric is if we focus solely on individual responsibility, we then ignore society's responsibility. And society is very much responsible for the inequalities. So society has now taken actions to solve those problems. And unfortunately, in recent years, that hasn't been what society has been doing. <laughs>
Well, thank you. I want to say just in, in my uh, brief remarks and response here, of course, you, you're covered quite a bit of ground, so I can't uh, address everything, that I am not saying that there is no discrimination, okay? So let's get that straight. But I think what I am saying, and we, of course, we don't have all the social science data before us, unfortunately, so it's sort of, you know, whose version we will credit here, that if all of the external discrimination disappeared tomorrow, there would still be significant disparities between blacks and whites in elements like infant mortality, health, educational achievement. Let's just take those three for example, right? Take infant mortality. It turns out that there is a lot of substantial data that suggests that the single factor that is most important for infant mortality and infant morbidity, right, if you control for everything else is whether you're married or not. That is the single most important factor, controlling for income, for education, for prenatal health care, for race, right? Now, can the government get married for you? Can the government make that decision for you, right? It turns out that the marriage rate in the black community is a fraction of the marriage rate in the white community, and it is declining rapidly, even among men who are marriageable. We are talking about men who are employed, who could support a family. Those men are not choosing to get married. In many cases, they are choosing to father children by more than one woman, and that is the most unstable situation you could possibly imagine, and terrible for children. That is not something that the government can solve. Educational underachievement, right? I am not going to deny that there are disparities in income and in amounts on average spent for inner city schools, let's say in suburban schools, and clearly that is something that the government should work to address, and I'm, I'm all for that, right? But if you look across the nation, you see that school districts like Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia, which are almost exclusively African American, have some of the highest per pupil spending in the country and achieve some of the worst results, right? And that is because education is not something that one does to people. It is something that people do for themselves. Another piece of evidence that shows that no matter how much money we spend, you're not going to be able to close the gap, and I don't think spending is the solution, is that disparities in scores between black children and white children, even controlling for education of parents and parental income, those disparities open up prior to kindergarten, before children even get to kindergarten, we are talking one or two standard deviations difference, and those differences really don't change much through the course of the educational career. Black students, white students, and Asian students attending the very same school. So let's control for the school you're attending, right? Let's look at California. There's a large study that's been done of schools in California that looks within schools, right? Those gaps persist within schools. So once again, you know, the data just doesn't support that much of this is being done to people by outsiders. It supports that a goodly portion of it is, as we say in the social sciences, endogenous. Yeah, well, I thought we were supposed to get equal. Uh, yeah, we can go on. And but I promise to be brief. I, I promise. No, but I understood that we would get the. the I understood we would each get to respond to each other, and so. I, I think that, that, that's fine. I thought we were doing a trial style. Let's start with the state end. Yeah. Well, or we can take questions. We'll take questions. Uh, whatever you want. Please, please, absolutely, give a, give a response. I'm sorry. I'll do it real briefly. I think there's two questions here. First, why do the disparities exist? And second. What do we do with the disparities, given that they exist now? As to the former question, I think the problem with Professor Wax's description is she wants to put too much of the blame on the victim and too easily excuse society in terms of the history of discrimination. The reality is that 
if you look at why are there these disparities, it is because of the long legacy of discrimination. I and agree with that. Um, and I think that to just say it's because of individual responsibility doesn't fully account for, or even partially account for what's going on. And the second question is, what do we do with it here? And this may be where we most disagree. I focus on education spending. Um, I think that black children should have the same right to be disappointed by the failure of money as white children have. I think black children have the same right to be disappointed by private school education or fancy suburban schools as whites do. I don't know Philadelphia and DC. I do know Chicago where I grew up. And there's a tremendous difference in expenditures in the inner cities in Chicago compared to the Nutrier and Nile schools in the suburbs. I just moved here from Los Angeles. My son in fifth grade, fourth grade last year in Los Angeles had 64 kids to two teachers in a very good Los Angeles public school. If we lived in Beverly Hills, it wouldn't be that way. I think that you can't say that that's not a factor in educational achievement. It's an enormous factor. With regard to infant mortality, we may not be able to change the mirror rate, but we sure can make sure that every black teenager who's pregnant, every African-American woman who's pregnant, has access to prenatal care, which we know that access to prenatal care has a significant effect in decreasing infant mortality. But the reality is we haven't created those programs in recent years to expand the availability of medical care and medical information to those in minority communities. And so I am still very concerned that the effect of Professor Wax's change in rhetoric is to let society excuse its own responsibility and not face up to its social duties. And I think if we recognize that all of the problems that she's discussing are in large part a result of social choices over a long period of time, it's then society's responsibility to create problem programs to deal with these problems. And I think we as a society should be very ashamed that the last 20 or 30 years, we haven't done anything about creating new programs or even refurbishing current ones to deal with the problem. And then I think if we now just blame the victim, we make the problem all the worse. Now, uh, please, uh, do you want me to I'll do that. Uh, whoever has questions, uh, I guess I'll be moderating. Uh, Please raise your hand, Professor Siegel. It, it seems to me, to a large extent, that one could agree with both Professor Wax and Professor Chemerinsky that there needs to be a whole lot more individual responsibility coming from minority communities, and there needs to be a whole lot more social responsibility. And it's not clear to me why they're so incompatible. So, for example, if we take if we take the example of the schools. I don't think, Professor Wax, you would disagree that all other things being equal, more public funding available on a more equitable basis would be better for African Americans and other minorities in this country. It seems to me all you've really said is there may be other factors out there that in particular circumstances overwhelm the funding that is given, for example, in Philadelphia and D.C. But I think if we're serious about individual responsibility, if we're serious about this notion of merit what objection is there to taking all the local property taxes, putting them together at the state level, and having the state distribute them fairly? What right does a white kid have who, by a random act of history, is born into a rich neighborhood, get to go to better public schools? How can we attribute that to individual responsibility or merit or hard work? It's bad enough that you don't get to choose your parents. And it's bad enough that your parents determine your prospects to a greater extent than anything else. But if, we're, if, we, if, we, if we care about merit, if we care about individual responsibility, I don't see why smarter, better public funding, more of a social commitment, is the slightest bit in tension with the individual responsibility values that you trumpet. Well, as a matter of logic, it isn't, okay? And I'm not sort of sitting here opposed to spending more money on principle. By personal view, from looking at education policy and law to the extent I engage it uh, as a sort of student of inequality is that uh, there's, you know, the emphasis on, on spending more is displaced. I think that it's a substitute for the reforms that are needed, which are reforms in teacher training, reforms in curriculum, reforms in the way that schools are run, in discipline. I mean, I think that there are successful models out there and they're not necessarily more expensive than the less successful models. So I think throwing money at the problem is kind of a displacement from really focusing on what's wrong with the school system. That's my view. So in a way, I'm saying you're not going to get much bang for your buck out of it. 
But as, beyond that, I think there is a kind of victim mentality that always looks first to the outsider to solve your problems, instead of saying, you know, to hell with what they're doing for us or to us. We're going to take matters in our own hands, given the resources at our disposal, and we're going to make it work. And boy, that mentality is so much more effective than waiting for someone else to help you. The fact is, in order to get a good education, when you come right down to it, you know, you're going to think this is a crazy thing for me to say. What you need is a quiet place, an educated teacher, right, some good books, and the determination to learn. And if you have those, you've got 90% of what you need, and the rest is just bells and whistles, okay? My daughter goes to this outrageously overpriced, uh, overpriced prep school. You know, I think it's ridiculous, actually. And it's full of bells and whistles and all, all sorts of frou-frou and fancy stuff. And, you know, part of me knows that I'm just sort of shoehorning her you know, I'm, I'm using the money to shoehorn her into college, but on some level, I don't know that this has all that much to do with really learning. Now, that's just, you know, my philosophy. Now, why can't we do both? I think there is a kind of psychological displacement that's very, very pernicious. It's really just a sort of a matter of outlook and attitude. But forget it, you know, let's fund the schools, let's double the amount of money that we spend on inner city schools it won't make that much difference when you've got chaos at home, right? Parents who, you know, don't, I think, care about the right things, uh, social upheaval, uh, the, the sort of dysfunction that you have in that community is going to overwhelm however much money you spend. I, I cannot prove that, but I do honestly believe it to be so. There's something about the rhetoric of those people in that community that I have to confess I find very offensive. I very much agree with you, Neil, that I'm in favor of personal responsibility, but I don't ever want the emphasis on personal responsibility to ignore that there's a society responsibility. I think any parent with money would make the same choice as Professor Wax to send his or her child to the best school we can. That's why we've got to make sure that all children have the opportunities. And let's go through the kinds of things we're talking about here. Professor Wax says that what goes on before kindergarten is enormously important. So we need to make sure that every parent has the ability to send their child to a preschool program, when in reality, those without income often don't have it available, and Head Start funding has been cut back. Let's talk about student-faculty ratios. As a parent of four children, and having watched the schools they've been to, I really believe for some students, student-faculty ratio matters enormously. When you've got a situation where it's one teacher for 32 kids, or is it sometimes in LA, one teacher for 50 or 55 kids, it's not the same education as my kids are getting now at Duke School, where it's two teachers for 24 kids for a fifth grade class. It's not the same educational experience. I want to talk about facilities. I can go through the schools in the Los Angeles area where the kids don't have books, where it's rat infested, where the facilities aren't there for minimal education. And those tend not to be in the white communities. They tend to be in the predominantly minority communities. And so I'm all in favor of individual responsibility, but not if it's directing the problem away from the fact that society has created a system where it makes it much more likely that black children and Latino children will fail. Next question. Dr. Wax, do you believe that remedial legislation uh, actually prevents restoration of communities? Well, I don't want to go that far. I think that it does represent a kind of, um, I think, you know, there's the law of conservation of mental energy. And I think the focus on, on the legislator fix, right, the government engineered fix, the sort of millennial day when, when society ceases to be racist, quote unquote, and I shouldn't even put that in quotes because I'm not denying that there isn't racism out there. Uh, I think that that focus does um, sap the kind of determination and energy that is required to solve the problems from within. Um, you know, I think, for example, if the black community focused more on trying to fix their broken families, 
um, than uh, you know, trying to get legislation to abate discrimination, they'd probably get a lot further in the long run. Now you'd say, well, why can't they do both? Well, you know, I'm not sure that as a matter of just limited resources, they really can do both. Um, but really, I think it's very much a kind of outlook and a mentality. Um, the example I give is I'm from a very devout Jewish family, and I can tell you that I heard nothing, I, I heard endless discussions of oppression and persecution and all the ways in which Jews have been discriminated against throughout history in my home. But what I never heard was anybody using that historical fact to either explain or excuse anything about their own life. Okay? Success, failure, outcomes. They never took that history of discrimination and translated it down to the ground as anything pertinent to what was happening to them, right? So there was sort of a full sense of locus of control and agency that one was the author of one's own fate, one's own life. So I think it's, it's in the sense that it undermines that conviction that one is the author of one's own fate and one's own life that it becomes pernicious, but that, that's just a theory. Professor Wax's answer began by saying, if the black community would devote the resources to improving the family that they direct towards anti-discrimination legislation, they would be better off. That, to me, really tells what her position is, that she doesn't want to see society facing up to its responsibilities. I don't know what it even means to say the black community devote its resources to healing its family. I don't know what that would translate into in terms of practical terms, but I do have a sense of the kinds of legislation that's still needed. It's interesting that Richard Nixon, yes, Richard Nixon proposed a guaranteed annual income, a negative income tax. It was a Republican president who basically said that every person in this society should have enough for minimum subsistence. Look how far we've come that now welfare reform has become how soon can we kick people permanently off the welfare rolls. I think we need to come back to a time where we say it is the responsibility of society to make sure that every single child has enough food. Every single child has adequate medical care. Every single child has a decent place to live. And I don't deny individual responsibility, but I think we've got to focus on society as that responsibility to its children as well. Let me add something in here. Richard Nixon is an interesting example. I, mean, I didn't admire the man very much, but I think that maybe his reasoning behind some of that is that he at least grew up in somewhat straightened circumstances. And when I was listening to the comments about you know, black people not taking care of their own, I went back to my childhood uh, in central Illinois, a small town, 3,500 people, and I never knew a black person. I never knew a Jewish person, actually, in, in my hometown. I knew lots of poor white kids. And you know what? They were very similar to the black children you talk about. There were kids that came in in rags who were hungry. Uh, I recognize that afterwards. I have a sense of empathy for them and understand why they did not learn in school. And if they had had the opportunity for some food and decent clothing, now I don't mean to say that they were just so impoverished that they were in absolute rags, but they had hand-me-downs. They had never had the food. They had support from the school. Lunch. Those kids didn't learn. And that could have been corrected. And so I analogize from that because too often it's focusing in on the poor black people when in fact the examples that I'm giving are circumstances not necessarily just lack of will determines how children learn. And that's when I was responding to the thing. You know, I wish I could, could take you back to some of those days to, to really see that, see what I saw. Well, I, I think, you know, that, that's a very telling comment because I think that comment really is in some respects caught in the simpler, <coughs> in the simpler mentality of the past. We have moved beyond the point where lack of clothing, lack of food, last, lack of the basic necessities is a problem that looms large. And this is just, I mean, sociologists, economists, they have looked at this. The biggest problem in the black inner city community now is obesity, not starvation. I mean, we've got to move on. We've got to move on to the present, but we've also, look, which I'm is social, not like the past. I'm a social psychologist. I, I can speak from this thing, too. What are we learning? Poor, here, you, one of the well, but let's talk up. about Poor the present. Poor people, when they have no money, buy fat 
foods because they are okay. cheap. But they're not, the reason they're not learning is not because they're hungry, okay? It's because it's a different set of circumstances. I agree that the children are the true victims here, right? But what is the problem? They've got a mother who's got a sort of revolving door set of boyfriends. They have a chaotic home situation. They have an unreliable, you know, parental, familial setting. They've got violence-ridden communities. Violence is not something that comes down from the sky. Violence is something that people do. It involves choices that people make, okay? Nothing that the white community does forces an individual to pick up a gun, aim that gun at another person, and shoot it, right? Nothing that uh, some white person does will force a black person to abandon the mother of his child. These, these are free people we are talking about who are free to make better choices within the constraints that society now maintains. Right? So I just simply do not enter into this paradigm that we have puppets on a string that are destined to make the choices that they make given the circumstances that they have. I guess I reject that idea. Well, you know, I, I suppose I, I'm similar to Urban in the sense Nobody is arguing that there isn't a need for some change in responsibility. But, but I mean, listening again to your rhetoric, it's all their fault, their fault, their Well, no, fault. it's not their fault that they are in their present dilemma. I am saying going forward, what government program can fix educational underattainment within the same school district, within the same schools, prior to going to school? And you talk about Head Start. Head Start doesn't fix it. It's parental and community behavior that is the dominant influence on whether children are ready to go to school, OK? Head Start is just a drop in the bucket. It produces a small and transient effect. And this has been studied to death, all right? So you can say, well, if we just had preschools, the problem would be solved. But the evidence belies that, all right? Now you're saying, now what do we need? Well. We need some kind of change of cu in culture and behavior, all right? What is it? Let's get working on that, but first we have to admit it. Let me just add here, no one's saying, to use your phrase, that anybody's puppet's on a string. I agree with what Professor Vidmar says, that obviously we're in favor of individual responsibility, but there's also social responsibility. Um, when you start talking about revolving doors and all the other things, I really do think you're playing on the worst stereotypes and generalizations. Um, but well, let me I talk about the, no, let me finish. I didn't, I have not interrupted you at all. Don't interrupt, and then you can have your chance to say whatever you want. Um, in terms of food, I'm actually on the board of directors of Mazone, which is an international, folks, particularly in this, but international hunger relief agency. And I've now been reading reports on the extent of hunger in America among poor children. It's not a problem that's gone away. And in terms of obesity, Professor Bidmar is consistent with the studies that I've read, that often the obesity is because of the high fat diets, but there is a significant problem of hunger still in the United States, especially among poor children. With regard to Head Start, there are a number of studies that have shown that children who go through the Head Start program have a lasting, lifelong benefit in terms of educational achievement. Preschool does matter. Does it solve all the problem? No, but I'm not arguing it solves the whole problem. I am saying that these things do have a beneficial effect, and society has the responsibility to do these things. And that's what I keep finding absent from your rhetoric. I just wanted to say one thing, which is I, I understand that I've been accused of playing on stereotypes, but you know, numbers don't lie. We are talking about 69% uh, out of wedlock birth rate in the black community compared to a 26% out of wedlock birth rate in the white community, or 27%. I mean, that's, that's about as stark as you get. And you, know, you could call me, well, you can, you can say that I'm indulging stereotypes by talking about those statistics, but they are undeniable. I mean, but they're, but why are they that way? That's the well, they're that way because of racism. Because but how do you change them? How do you change those numbers? How do you change those numbers? What, are, what is the first step in changing that number? And the second step in changing? How can the 70% be reduced to the 26%? What government program can do that? 
No government program can do that. Not overnight. No. Not ever. Okay, we'll take a next question. And just for future reference, if you, there will be an opportunity after this is over to talk one on one a little more. But let's, uh, we've got only probably another 10 minutes or so in the room, so it's question and answer. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I should I should preface my remarks by saying I'm not actually a, a student here. I'm in the process of applying, but um, what I do now, <laughs> what I do now is I work on, on public health educational videos, primarily in the African American community. And as a result of that, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of the um, grassroots efforts in the African American community by African Americans themselves to correct some of the problems you're talking about and the obstacles they face are overwhelming and by no means of their own doing. Take nutrition, you said that obesity is somehow a contrast to, to hunger. Now in the African American community, in African American neighborhoods in Durham, the local markets that they have access to, through public transportation, unless they have cars of their own, do not have fresh fruits and vegetables. So you can educate them all they want, but if they don't have access, it's meaningless. You can talk to young African-American women about the importance of reading to their kids, but if they're working two jobs to make ends meet, that is meaningless. And there are huge, massive efforts in the African-American community by African-Americans themselves to correct the problems you're talking about, and without the institutional support, and without the government support, and without the funding, it's meaningless. And I I'm disagree with you. I don't do think two them? jobs is an obstacle to reading to your child. There are immigrants from other countries who are working round the clock, and they manage to read to their children. I just don't see it that way. I disagree. So is it genetic, or what's the problem? Oh, well, it has nothing to do with genetics. Uh, so, how, so how do you factor in race and factor How does genetics come in here? It's behavioral. Behavior is not genetics. Behavior has to do with choice, the very opposite of genetics. So the, uh, the illustration of the paraplegic, I think, is an interesting one because um, had that arisen in the tort context, the tort feeser would be financially responsible for creating the conditions right. within which the paraplegic could then succeed. And then there would come a point where the paraplegic's efforts would be indispensable to success. The, the effort would have to be from the individual. That can't be. There's no drug that can inject that into an individual. So the, the framework here, it seems to me, is one in which the argument needs to be over what the right structural analog is to getting to the point mm -hmm. where it becomes now a situation where the tortfeasor has done all that the tortfeasor ought to and can do and at what point then individual effort needs to be built into the process as essential to success. And that is one of those quasi-empirical kinds of questions. It sounds empirical, but <laughs> I doubt we're ever going to get any agreement on the empiricism of it. Um, but it strikes me that it's the, the the, the response of, gee, we've created a deep and intractable problem for you, or heavily contributed to it, and it's now so, uh, it's now an engine that goes by itself, and gee, we're sorry, um, isn't yet at that point. Now, I guess your, your, your thesis is that, in fact, we are at that point. We've done everything that we should and can do to get the paraplegic up to the point where now it's sheer individual effort that just has to supply whatever is necessary. And what I hear in the room is a lot of disagreement about whether we're at that point. Uh, and I guess the concern is that there are a lot of people in the country who would like to be able to com comfortably turn on their heel and walk away from this problem. Uh, that would be aided by the conviction that, gee, we've done, we've done all we could, and everything else now is up to them, or what, whatever the descriptor is. And I guess there's just there's a lot of resistance that some people have to thinking that we have. Now, maybe you can 
we can array the analyses and convince ourselves that that's the case. That, that there are lots of studies that, that not of the kind you've been describing that suggest that there is some discrimination that's still going on in society that's pretty substantial. I mean, the kinds of studies where two people submit resumes <laughs> over the internet and they are identically resume except one name is a suggests an African American and the other name suggests an East Eastern European or a, or a wasp and there's statistically significant discrimination that arises in that, that situation. Or, or when black people and white people, again, with trumped up identical resumes, go in to buy a used car. Uh, the, the same uh, used car dealer deals with them in different ways. Well, let me, th that's a good example, because I'm, once again, I'm not denying that there's discrimination, but I'm familiar with those studies, and they do show disparities. But the magnitude of those disparities is remarkably small. So for example, the Urban Institute study that tries to field uh, applicants for a job with similar resumes finds that, let's say, whites are called back 15 or 10 percent more than blacks. We're, I mean, these are, these are significant, statistically significant differences. They're not found in every city. In some cities, blacks are favored over whites. The data here is modest. So I'm not saying that discrimination doesn't exist. What I'm saying is that at this point in our history, the tail is wagging the dog, right? To be obsessed with those uh, small but significant and regrettable disparities to the exclusion of the other things that are going on, okay, which are behavioral. And this has been studied. I mean, sociologists and labor economists like Jim Heckman have crunched the numbers, they've done the regressions, and what they're finding is, not surprisingly, that these external sort of conventional forms of discrimination are rapidly and significantly diminishing, and what we're getting is behavioral factors looming larger. Shaker Heights High School, blacks at the bottom of the class, right? Whites in the middle of the class, Asians at the top of the class, disparities that shrink somewhat when you control for education of parents or income of parents, but that by no means go away. All right? right. So I what's know, left? I merge two analytically distinct points. The distinct point about the studies is, of course, if, if ceteris paribus, I would hope that the residual discrimination is rather small. That's analytically distinct. But it exists. And yes, it does. And it's analytically distinct from the issue of whether the people who created, who caused the accident have done right. what they can and should do to create the conditions of success. Right. Those and are two there it's just how many points. bang are you getting, how much bang are you getting for your buck? And that has been studied as well. So for example, in education, right? Well, hey, it may cost more. For an additional $5,000. It may cost society more than it ought to. I mean, correction is often much more expensive than prevention. But there may be a responsibility, nevertheless, to pay for that very expensive right. physical therapist. But here's the point. You could, you could offer gold-plated physical therapy instead of just sort of your basic physical therapy, right? And maybe you'll get 5% more out of the gold-plated than you would out of the basic. But here's the rub. In neither case will you come close to making him walk again if his considerable, arduous, effort, effortful input is not there. And I think what's resisted, rightly, because it is unjust, is the idea that after all this time, after all this discrimination and slavery and all of this wrong, we're still asking these people to put in a gargantuan effort, right? And they have to put it in. And we, the children of privilege, of white privilege, don't need to do that? That is outrageous. And what I'm saying is, somebody tell me what the alternative is. You and I teach the civil rights cases. And I'm always struck by the Supreme Court in 1883, 18 years after the Civil War, saying, you know, there's a time at which a group of people have to stop being beneficiaries. We're at that point right now, and we should just treat everybody the same. And I'm always amazed that society was so quick to say, our responsibility is over. Now, you mentioned the example of employment discrimination. 
I read statistics, and it's so striking in terms of housing, in terms of the enormous discrimination, not a small amount of discrimination that exists, in terms of availability of loans. The ability of a black family to move to what Professor Wax would call a safer area is so much more limited because of the discrimination with regard to lending rates. We can talk about the disparity in funding in schools. We can talk about the disparity in terms of access to medical care. Well, the disparity with regard to hunger. I'm all in favor of greater personal responsibility, but I think it's society's responsibility to deal with all of those things. And what bothers me so much as I listen to you is I keep hearing the, let's blame the victim and excuse society. And maybe that's not what you mean to be saying, but it's sure what I hear is I listen to your rhetoric and read your words. We have time for one more question. Okay, well, this has been a very heated and uh, interesting debate, and I want to thank on behalf of the Federal Society and Duke Law School, Professor Wax, for coming here, Professor Jones, for agreeing to do this. Thank you.